continues uh, the uh, Bill and Esther Zaram, Professor of Bioengineer Biology and Bioengineering at Caltech. Um, I've known Michael for a number of years. Uh, it's really, really great to have him uh, visiting here. I'm not going to give a long introduction, but amongst his many um, awards, he is a member of uh, fellow of the AAAS and uh, MacArthur Award winner. So uh, it's a really great uh, opportunity to have him speak here. And thank you for coming, Michael. <coughs> Th thanks, everybody. Like, I, I, it's just been such a great reception so far. I'm, I'm kind of astonished because there's really not that many people at Caltech who, you know, g give a rat's ass about what I do. So it's, um, I, I feel a little bit like, like, like the aging, you know, rock musician who can't sell any albums back home but finds he's still big in Japan or something. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, it's, it's enjoyable to be here. Uh, I've never visited uh, G Georgia Tech or Emory. Um, I've been here a couple times before um, in the city, but it's just great to be here on campus. So I, I want to talk to you today about some of the research we've been doing in my laboratory over the last few years um, that have to do with the behavior of flies. And the aspect of, of fly behavior that has you know, most interested my group um, you know, almost for really uh, th three decades now um, is, is flight behavior. And flight evolved four times. We, we know pretty accurately exactly four times in the history of life in birds, bats, pterosaurs, and insects. And I think it's just worth saying a little bit about why flight is important and why whenever f flight evolved, it led to this enormous diversification of, of, of species. Um, and that's still true with, with, with birds and bats and insects, and it was true for pterosaurs before they went extinct. Um, so this is a, a, a picture of uh, students of comparative physiology will recognize it. Um, it's, it's, what it is a plot, each, each point is a measurement made in a given animal um, that vary across nine orders of magnitude in body size, um, you know, basically from, from ants to elephants. And, and what is plotted is um, a, a physiological measurement called the cost of transportation, the energy required to carry a given amount of body mass at a given distance. And what's remarkable about these data is that all, all the data uh, falls on, on, on a single curve uh, on this log-log uh, plot. And this is for animals that, that walk and run. If you plot similar data, the cost of transport for animals that fly, you again, quite remarkably, find that the data fall on a, a, a line of similar slope, but it's displaced um, downward about tenfold um, <clears throat> um, on, the, on the ordinate axis, which means that similar sized animals can, can fly 10 times more cheaply than, than walking. Um, and, and this has had profound uh, consequences for the history of life, really, because it, it, it makes migration a viable thing. Flying long distances, you know, across vast landscapes where there's no food available to get to places that, where food is available, which of course means that all around the planet, um, th there's biomass on the move, and, and that biomass on the move has consequences for the animals that rely on that biomass. So it's an important engine in um, world ecology. Just to be uh, fair to my um, ichthyological friends, um, you can plot the same data for swimming, and again, you get the same line displaced even lower, which of course makes sense because the other place where you find migratory animals is, 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 is in the oceans with, with whales and salmons and so forth. Um, but there's something particularly, I, I think, a gripping about the evolution of insect flight, which happened about 400 year, a million years ago um, at the transition between the Silurian to the Devonian period. Um, <clears throat> insects, as I'm sure you all know, at least of macroscopic organisms, are the most species-rich group um, on the planet. A uh, number of described species uh, uh, outnumber everything else. And within insects, um, I've always uh, gravitated towards flies, which is the great evolutionary biologist David Grimaldi describes as really the most ecologically diverse group of, 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 of insects. You find them on all, on all continents and all different lifestyles. Um, and they're just great flyers. You know, they're called flies for a reason. Um, and, and just to illustrate this, this is a, a sequence shot in my laboratory at 7,500 frames a second in infrared lighting that shows two flies that were on a collision course. And both flies can see the other fly in their field of view. And they elicit within um, just a few tens of milliseconds. This whole sequence lasts 200 milliseconds, or a fraction of a human eye blink. The animals see each other perform this, this beautiful uh, rolled uh, banked turn 
to redirect their aerodynamic force vectors so that they uh, avoid collision. And it's just these sorts of behaviors um, being studied from the sensory side and the motor side that have really been the, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, <clears throat> substratum for the, the, the research within the laboratory. What I'd like to do today is, is to really focus on, on kind of two um, specializations that we find in flies. Um, and I, <clears throat> I like to put things in evolutionary perspective. Um, and I also like to think about the, the evolution of organisms, particularly flies, within sort of clusters of adaptations, because I think this is sort of what the, the fossil record would suggest. One cluster of adaptations that dates back to the origins of insects, I call it the, sort of the D Devonian toolkit. Um, so flies share these, these ancient modules with all insects, and then a, a, a later a cluster of adaptations that occurred um, back in the Triassic when, when flies uh, uh, radiated. So these would be traits that flies share in uh, a common uh, with, with other flies. And, and, and the two, the two uh, specific features I want to talk about are, are navigation, um, which I think makes sense, and uh, <clears throat> colloquially, and the dip, dipterine flight motor, uh, which I might have to explain. A, a little bit more detail. But let's think about navigation. So if you think about an insect that navigates, you probably think about you know, the monarch butterfly that's famous for these uh, transcontinental um, um, mo movements from, um, from Canada down, down to Mexico, um, the entire loop taking many generations. But, but what you may not appreciate and what is emerging uh, uh, over the last uh, 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 30 years or so is that you know, we're aware of monarchs migrating because we're big, we can see them, but many, many, many insects migrate um, or uh, disperse over very, very large distances. And, and <clears throat> my focus really goes back to the work of Theodosius Dobzhansky, the famous uh, 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 geneticist, um, who was uh, working with his protégés back when he was actually at Caltech before he kind of got booted out of Caltech. But, um, in, in the early days of being able to identify genetic differences among populations, what Dobjonsky and his protégés recognize is that species of endemic Drosophila flies, uh, various different species, but populations that were um, at very different lo lo locations, hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometers apart, were genetically very, very similar. And this raised a bit of a paradox because at the time people couldn't imagine how these you know, two to three millimeter sized animals could actually fly those distances in order to you know, share their genes with, with other populations. Um, but in the late 70s and early 80s, a, a, a prominent uh, uh, a population geneticist, Jerry Coyne, and, 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 and other folks collaborated on a series of experiments, of which I'm only just going to talk about one, which tried to sort of ask the question, maybe we're underestimating what these little flies can do. And in one such experiment that was performed in Death Valley National uh, uh, Park, they collected from the wild, um, roughly uh, uh, 100,000 uh, Drosophila, which 60,000 were the common Drosophila melanogaster, um, or, or <clears throat> a, a sibling species. So they released 60,000 fluorescently tagged flies, um, and then they had uh, buckets of, of, of banana and yeast mash uh, located uh, about seven kilometers in one direction, 15 kilometers in another direction. And in the next day at 9 a.m., they looked in those buckets to see if they caught anything. And they caught kind of coincidentally 17 of these fluorescently tagged flies, um, uh, these very, very large, large distances across the desert. So this would suggest that we really are underestimating the, the um, capabilities of these little tiny insects. But there's, this was like a three-page paper. Um, it's not there's no data on how long it took the flies to fly. Um, it's whether they fanned out across the desert, and it's just the flies that happen to fly towards the, you know, the, the banana mash were the lucky ones. Um, very little detail was known. So what my lab has been trying to do in recent years is to replicate these kinds of studies, but using um, somewhat more modern technology. Death Valley, where uh, is now a national park, um, you're not allowed to release 100,000 uh, flies. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, there's Bureau of Land Management land nearby, um, where uh, you still have to get a permit that causes a little bit of consternation. But nevertheless, um, it's possible to do these experiments. Um, and and, and th these were uh, p pioneered by Floris von Bruegel, uh, Kate Leach, and Francesca Ponce in my laboratory. And this is what it looks like. So it's an old dry bakelite. There's absolutely nothing there. So it's a perfect kind of 
place to do these sorts of experiments. And so what we do is we have traps um, that have a camera system with a computer that is capturing the images of flies arriving on the trap. And the trap has little mesh funnels that allow the flies to go in, um, if they so care to, um, to the bait, the bait being um, treetop apple juice uh, fermented for exactly 24 hours with champagne yeast, which makes CO2 and ethanol, which are the main long distance cues that the flies are using. Um, so this is what one of these releases looks like. Um, shot by me, um, co cowering on the ground, um, because th th this is sort of what it feels like to release a hundred thousand flies. Um, they, 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 they get in every orifice, and I mean every, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> and, and so the, the experiments, we, we've done a lot of different geometries, but in the typical experiment we have an array of traps, usually ten traps, um, in a two kilometer ring around the release site. Um, and, and this is just a kind of a cartoon of what we th think is going on. I'm not going to show you all the data that, that sort of justifies that this is actually happening. But flies leave the release site. And some flies fly in a, in a fixed direction. They hit the plume that's coming from the trap. And then they, they crawl up and down the plume using a, a algorithm called cast and search that I, I don't have time to talk about. But then they get to the trap and that's where we capture them with the cameras. That's how they, we, 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 we capture them in the traps. Some flies are sort of lucky that they fly directly to the trap and they get there right away because they don't have to crawl up into the plume. And some flies, I don't know if you say they're the lucky ones or the unlucky ones, but they head out and the, you know, they're the Jack Kerouac flies that just head out into the open uh, landscape. So, um, we, we have a weather system that is telling us the wind magnitude and direction every time we do one of these release experiments. Um, and because we've done this a number of times, uh, at different times we go out, the, the wind is sort of stronger and stronger and from a different direction. And, and, and using wind as an independent variable turns out to be rather important. So this is sort of re-plotting some of the data we have, all oriented it so the, wind, the, the mean wind uh, direction was down. And the important thing I want you to note is that it really depends on how strong the wind is, is blowing. If, if the wind is relatively gentle, we get a, a, a more or less uh, uniform distribution of flies captured at all the traps. Where the stronger and stronger the wind is, we, we, we tend to catch fewer flies and, and more of them at just downwind traps. Um, and, and so basically what I'm trying to tell you is, is the data that's necessary to, to, to develop a model of, of what we think the flies are doing. Um, so one critical feature of this model is if you take experiments that were done uh, when the wind was relatively gentle and you plot the time course of the flies that are arriving on the trap or are inside the trap that we can actually also capture with the camera. So what's plotted in the green and black traces is the arrival time the, uh, uh, of the flies on the upwind traps and the downwind traps. And, and the remarkable thing is that although more are going downwind, but they're arriving at the same time, which means the flies must be regulating their velocity. So that flies that are flying into the wind, um, regulating their velocity using the, the optic flow, their visual perception of their own motion, are flying at the same speed as the flies that are going with the wind. So they, they must be sort of regulating their airspeed in order to, to, to have this uh, fixed ground speed. So that turns out will be a, a kind of critical feature of our model. Um, and, and so <clears throat> one way to sort of visualize how we can sort of test different hypotheses is um, we, we, we get these arrivals on the trap and the minimum, the, the first flies we see on the trap sort of represents the minimum flight time. Probably the flies that were lucky enough to head directly towards the trap after they're released. And so for every trap and every experiment, we can measure that minimum ground speed that the flies were flying. And we can also measure the component of wind velocity in that direction, um, which of course to another trap, you know, that parallel wind velocity would be in a slightly different direction. So if we plot this estimated ground speed against the parallel wind velocity, we get this distribution of points, which has a lot of variability as you expect in field experiments. But there's sort of kind of certain features of it um, that when the wind speed is low, whether it's blowing against the fly or with the fly, um, the flies, uh, uh, the, the estimated ground speed, you know, doesn't really change. But as, as the, the wind velocity gets stronger and stronger, um, 
the flies tend to, to move at a speed that is best approximated by the wind. So they're sort of advecting at high wind velocity, but they're regulating their, their ground speed at low wind velocity. And so this is what, I'm just going to show this in vector form, not in mathematical form, but this allowed us to develop a, 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 a model. And the model is as follows. Each fly chooses a heading, a heading, an orientation in the world, and I'll talk about this later, relative to the position of the sun. And, and every fly just sort of randomly chooses a slightly different heading. It maintains ground speed in the forward direction using its visual system. Um, yet the wind, it allows the wind to push itself sideways. So it doesn't regulate the side slip that it experiences. It only regulates um, the influence of the wind along its longitudinal body axis. Uh, and so the resultant velocity vector would look like this. So the flies are, are not necessarily flying uh, along their, their longitudinal body position. So in cheesy PowerPoint animation, this is sort of what the behavior would look like. So all the flies, each one chooses an orientation relative to the sun. And, and the flies move away at, with a velocity vector that's determined by this forward ground speed regulation, but also this unregulated side slip generated by the wind. So when we implement our models via simulation with just a, a few free parameters, their preferred ground speed, uh, there's some sort of saturation. They, they, you know, they can't generate infinite airspeed. So they have a maximum airspeed and a minimum airspeed. And we do, you know, using computer, thousands and thousands of simulations using the, the wind speeds that we measure in the field. We get a distribution of, 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 of within the model simulation that, that, that you know, matches the measured values from the field pretty well. And I, I don't really want to go into, th this slide is like way too complicated, but just to give you some you know, sense, you were trying to approach some rigor, this is testing the model that I just described to you about against a whole bunch of other models that are in the literature on migratory insects that don't involve regulating ground speed, don't involve uh, the, the, this uh, phenomenon of the animals maintaining a fixed heading as they move. Um, and, and, and so far, you know, our model sort of fits the data we measure in the field better than any of the, 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 the other models th that are out there. Um, now, what we're trying to do is to go back in the laboratory and test this model more rigorously using something we call a virtual desert, where we have an animal that's tethered to a fine pin that, 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 that can rotate I itself by changing its direction. We can present it with, with ground flow through an electronic display. And the animal is sort of sitting inside a wind tunnel that we can position at arbitrary uh, orientations with respect to, to the fly. So we, you know, we have a way of sort of more uh, specifically testing the, the, the predictions of our model. But I, I want to. Rather than talking about preliminary data from this, I, I want to sort of move more towards the neurobiological perspective and talk about this one critical feature of our model that has to do with the animal using the sun to orient its body position and the fact that each fly, somewhat counterintuitively, will choose a different orientation in which to maintain during the migratory flights. So um, I want to make a clear distinction between two behaviors. Um, phototaxis would be a behavior in which an animal flies directly towards a source of light or directly away from a source of light if it was negative phototaxis. But the behaviors I'm talking about are, are described as menotaxis, where what the animal does is maintain its orient, its, it, some fixed orientation, some angular orientation relative to a sun that it, that, that it then maintains over time. And so the way we study this in the laboratory, and this is the work of uh, Isabel Geraldo, who's still in the lab, but she's about to start her own research group at University of California, Riverside. We have flight simulators where we tether flies to fine little pins. We use a camera system to measure the motion of the wings. And, and from that camera system, we can infer whether the fly is trying to steer left or right. And we can allow it to play a little video game where it can control with its wing motion the angular velocity of this one small bright spot, which we consider um, the ersatz sun, and it, we're making the assumption that the animal is responding to it as it would a sun. So in a typical experiment, what you see, if you plot the heading of the animal over time, is that for a couple minutes, it sort of spins the sun uh, all different orientations, and then it locks in on a particular angle um, that is not necessarily 
putting the, the, the sun right in front of it. In this particular case, the animal actually chose an angle of about 90 degrees. And so if you, you can plot these uh, data, as it is often done in the orientation literature, um, by plotting the vector strength, which is sort of the, the sum over the whole experiments of all of the instantaneous orientation vectors. The length of that vector goes from 0 to 1, and the closer it is to 1, um, the, 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 the greater fidelity to a particular orientation. And then the orientation is plotted by sort of allowing uh, like, like the hands of a, of a clock. And so what these data show is that if you do this to a bunch of, of, of flies, um, each fly will sort of choose its own um, um, orientation. And very interesting, if you stop the fly after it started in the arena, you give it a rest up to two hours, and you test it again, the heading during the first experiment is the same, is, is highly correlated to the heading of the second experiment. So they're remembering this orientation angle over long periods of time, which raises interesting neurobiological uh, consequences. So now, um, I need to tell you about something, especially if you're not a Drosophila a, a person, that has really kind of revolutionized, well, maybe that's you know, overstating it, because who, not that many people care about flies, but um, uh, it, 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 a, a sort of a breakthrough, if you will, in the study of navigation and spatial organization and place memory in flies, through the work of several laboratories, most notably uh, Vivek J. Raman at, at Janelia Farm, Gabby Mayman, a former uh, a postdoc of mine who's at uh, uh, Rockefeller, there's a, a region in the brain of the fly called the central complex because it's complex and it's central. Um, <laughs> and it's a region of neuropil um, that has uh, two very important structures uh, that I'm going to talk about, one called the uh, protocerebral bridge, which is this sort of bicycle handlebar region, and then the ellipsoid body that literally is a torus. It's a, it's a, it's a donut in the brain of the fly, you know, just like Homer Simpson, mapped in the brain. And these regions of the brain contain a set of neurons called the EPG neurons um, that in this region of the brain, um, the <coughs> uh, uh, dendrites uh, uh, sit like little uh, uh, slices of pizza uh, around the pizza. And what those regions encode is the azimuthal orientation of, of, of the animal. Um, so you literally have a circle that encodes 306 deg degrees of spatial orientation. Um, and then the, the terminals actually uh, represent that 360 degree orientation uh, twice. So if what happens when the animal is either walking or flying is that there's a spot of, of, of high activity that rotates around that circle depending upon what orientation the animal is in space. Um, and a, a lot of interest in this because it represents, it, it, it represents a, a neural structure called a ring attractor that is sort of, was sort of a hypothetical thing. And this seems to be a manifestation. In a ring attractor, you sort of have a whole bunch of different modules that only one, got, one, 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 one module can be active at any given moment. And it inhibits all the other ones around it. And so let me just give you a sense of what it looks like. So this uh, blob of green activity that's circling around this uh, donut region, this is a fly in a flight simulator recorded in our laboratory. As the fly is sort of steering around, its, 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 its representation of, of where it's heading is, 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 is uh, causing this bump to move around inside this circular region in, in the brain. So here's another such movie imaging the pattern of activity, the proto-cerebral bridge, where you sort of see the two windshield wipers of activity moving back and forth because azimuthal heading is encoded twice. Uh, so we can actually have the animal performing this uh, a sun orientation while we're recording the activity um, from this region of the brain. And, and what you can see is the position of this bump you know, around the circle is tracking the position of the sun around the animal. And what Isabel and, 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 and Kate have done in the laboratory, these imaging experiments with W. Eva Ross, and th these are techniques that are available in Drosophila. They're very, very, very specific driver lines for these cells and these cells only. Um, so it's possible to silence these neurons by expressing an inward rectifying potassium conductance. And when you do that, you get a rather interesting result. So here's the control data. Um, 
where it's basically all the genetics are the same except that the, 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 the sequence of this potassium channel is missing. And there you see the typical experiment that you know, each fly chooses a, a heading, holds that heading over time. If you get rid of these compass neurons, what you end up with is phototaxis. The animals can maintain the sun in a given position, but they can only fly directly towards it. Um, and, and so this is sort of a, a cartoon, the result that w with the compass system intact, you, the animal can perform mean attacks. Without the compass system, you end up with just phototaxis. And the reason why we think, we think the, 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 the phototactic circuitry, I don't have time to, to go into the evidence for this, is sort of a completely different parallel pathway. So you, you take away mean attacks and the system sort of collapses to just flying towards the, 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 the bright object. And, and, and what we're trying to do now in the laboratory and what Isabel wants to do in her future research is, is get down into the, uh, you know, the other elements of, of, of this circuitry to really understand how um, the animal can use this compass signal and compare it to some representation of the heading that it's trying to maintain. Um, and, and how that discrepancy between like where I'm trying to hold the sun, where the sun is, causes a, you know, an error signal that makes the animal steer. So that's sort of where things are going. What I want to do um, in, instead, because I, I think it's kind of more interesting from the perspective of, of animal evolution, is just mention that the thing that fascinates many of us about the central complex, it, it is incredibly conservative across species. You find almost identical structure in grasshoppers, cockroaches, wasps, dung beetles, moths, fl uh, flies, bees, and so forth. And, and in the work that's um, most uh, uh, prevalently done by, by Stanley uh, Heinze, there's a, an emerging picture about how this, pr this ancestral um, compass system has, has been tweaked in a bunch of different crown taxa to do, to do different things. So you, for example, in monarch butterflies, they also perform a solar metataxis to do their migration. But in that case, instead of picking a random heading, they pick a heading that will either send them south or north at the right time of year. Um, in the case of, 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 of bees, they use this compass setting in order to go back and forth from the hive to the flowers that they're foraging and, and so forth. So, you know, it, it's just a very, very interesting system, not only to think about a complicated computation, like where I am in space, where am I heading, but also to think about the evolution of nervous systems because this core hardware, this Devonian toolkit has been tweaked to either to do different things. And I, I just want to mention a, 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 one a story um, where, uh, that is just going to be at the behavioral level, but has to do with the, the, the role of this compass in terrestrial locomotion. So the cataglyphus uh, uh, ant, uh, uh, ant is, a, is a desert ant, lives in Tunisia, and it has an amazing behavior. Um, they live in a place where it's so hot that they can't lay down chemical cues. So every ant has to leave the nest. It goes on a circuitous route, finds food, and then goes straight back to the, to the nest. Right distance, right angle. Because it is performing a computation known as path integration. Um, and in order to do path integration, you need a compass. And so it's using exactly the same, we believe, uh, is using exactly the same compass in the central complex. You need some sort of metric, some sort of measurement stick. And you need, you need a form of memory. And, and Rudiger Weiner and his protégés, including Matthias Wittlinger, have done a lot of fantastic experiments to determine that the sun is the compass, largely, just as it is in fruit flies. Um, and the, the measurement stick uh, appears to be mostly counting with your, how far you walk with your legs. And these experiments were done by picking up the ant when it found the food and gluing stilts to its legs. So when the animal would walk, they would move further per stride than they would without the stilt. So they would just overshoot the nest. And then the easier experiment is to chop the legs in half and you get these little stumpies and these guys get halfway to the nest and then they start looking for the nest. So these are really classic experiments that shown that the, the flies have a step o o odometer. So what I would like to tell you is that as exotic as this behavior of path integration is, we have very strong evidence that flies exhibit this behavior as well. And I think it's actually something that probably all insects can do. And it's a slightly different context. So Vincent de Tier was a famous insect physiologist who described a behavior back in the, in the, in the 50s that he called dances. Um, 
And, and, and what the dance was is, is a hungry fly, if it finds food, it starts to do these sort of loopy behaviors around the food, going away and coming back, going away, coming back. Um, and, and what's the purpose of this? Well, the idea is if you find food, food tends to be patchy in the environment. So you find food, but don't stuff yourself because you know, there might be a better burrito nearby. You just do a little local search and, and you might find better food. And, and, and so Irene Kim, when she was working in, in a laboratory, we developed this system. So there's a fly walking around a little chamber. Um, in, the, in the middle, where the red dot, is a yummy drop of yeast. Uh, this is a hungry fly. Yeast is like the fly's favorite food. It has like the protein that this female fly needs to lay eggs and so forth. And the fly's searching all around. It's paying no attention to the yeast because it hasn't discovered it yet. And then it finds the yeast. And then immediately after it, it, it eats the yeast a little bit, its behavior changes. And it exhibits this behavior I showed in the last slide. It kind of walks away from the food, goes back to the food. It performs these, this behavior we call the, 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 the dances. And another experiment that Irene did to, to show that the fly must have a spatial memory of where the food is. In this experiment, the food was originally in the arena, but I, we quickly moved it to the edge of the arena, so the food's not there anymore. So all the chemical, if there's any chemical cues or visual cues, you know, they're over on the side of the arena with the red dot, but the fly keeps circling and going back to the place where the food used to be. This is also done in complete darkness. Um, it can be done in animals that have uh, 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 their uh, olfactory uh, capabilities. I'm compromised. So we know, and I'll give you further evidence, that this is done like the ants, idiothetically. Even their compass senses idiothetically because they have no access to the sun. They're keeping track of their orientation. They're keeping track of how far they go back. So a, a, a methodological breakthrough that simplifies our analysis of, the, of this system, um, which is easy in flies, uh, was implemented by Roman Corf Corfas in the laboratory, so we can even get rid of the food. Instead of giving the animals food, we can give them the optogenetic sense of food. So we take sugar receptors and we can uh, express channel rhodopsin in those sugar receptors. So um, in, in this case, the fly gets a, a little sugar reward, if you will, only when it goes to the center of the arena. And so even without the food, we can get this sort of beautiful optogenetically induced dance behavior. I'm sorry, I'm talking to you guys, and I realize there are guys over here, so maybe I should, I should come over here occasionally. Um, so the, the problem is, this is a mess of spaghetti. Like, what the hell is going on in this giant mess of spaghetti? So what we do is, is work with, with, with simplified geometry. So um, Amir Bebehani in the laboratory has a paradigm where the fly performs these behaviors, but it, it only has this linear circular track. It can just walk around uh, this circle. And so here's a little movie of the fly moving back and forth. But we can, again, have these sites where it gets the optogenetic reward. So we can basically perform dance in one dimension. So the way we analyze these data is to sort of, uh, kind of mathematically wrap them out. So we're plotting the angular position of the fly um, over time. And, and here's what a, a long sequence looks like. So before the optogenetic reward is activated, the flies are just walking all the way around the arena. And then when the optogenetic reward is activated, every time the fly goes past the spot, it gets a second of sugar sense. And then it's refractory for nine seconds. So in order to get more, it has to like, you know, go away and come back. And the, what the fly does is it goes away from the reward site, goes back. So it's performing these sort of one dimensional dances. Okay. So the, 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 the most interesting part of this whole experiment is what happens when we turn the reward away. And you notice that the animal continues to go back and forth around where the food was, the virtual food, but there is no food there. And there's no cue to food because there was never food there to begin with. And, and so when we do this analysis, we, we carefully sort of keep track of, of this behavior right after the food activation is over, when you know, everything that the fly is doing must be depending upon its, its, its memory of where the food was. And in particular, I'm going to just do a, a really, you know, kind of ridiculous and boring drill down into just the first couple of movements the fly does. The distance between the last food it sensed and the first time it turned around, we'll call R naught, or for the sort of first order or you know zero order run, and then the first. Uh, uh, a run between that turnaround point and the next turnaround point we call uh, R, R1. 
So if you plot those against one another, you plot the distance from the food to the first turn point and then the first turn point to the second turn point, you get a very strong linear relationship with a slope that's not significantly different than, than one. And so the model, just to spill the beans, what we think the animal is doing is it's counting, it, it, it's, it's measuring how far it goes from the food. And it's using that distance to determine how far it walks back in the other direction. So it's doing path integration in this very simplified one-dimensional fashion. OK, so you could say, well, but wait a minute. You could get this relationship just because some flies walk a little bit and other flies walk a lot. That has nothing to do with like, what an individual fly is remembering. And so you can test for that, at least partially, by testing the same fly again and again and again on the, on the same task. And what you find is that the you know, th this trend of this linear relationship between that, f that zero order run and the next run, it, you find um, within each individual fly um, for all the flies. So it, it, it's not just a, a trend that emerges because different flies are different. It seems to be a trend that emerges because the, f you know, the, the flies are experiencing something different when they walk further versus when they walk shorter. Um, so you could ask an interesting question. Can the flies remember two locations? What if you have two sites of food um, and you do the same experiment? Um, you look at what happens after the, the, the food's no longer available. And if you, for example, look at the distribution of these turnaround points after the food is no longer available, they, they, you know, they, 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 they pull apart when the food uh, sites were further apart. So this might make you think, aha, they must be able to remember two locations. But I don't think that necessarily is the case. And in fact, if you plot this uh, uh, first run versus the second run for the one food case, for the two food case, and for the, uh, another two food case, but where the inner food distance was larger, you find exactly the same relationship, same slope, but but, but the offsets of the curves are different. The, the, the y-intercepts are, 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 are different. So um, you know, what we're sort of proposing is that you know, there's sort of one thing the fly is remembering is the distance from the food to the first time it turned around. But then there's this sort of like offset distance, which is basically the overshoot, how fast it walks past the food when it's going back. If you plot that overshoot as a function of the distance between the food during the experiment, you, you, you find another relationship. So it suggests that the fly is performing and remembering another spatial integral. It's measuring the distance between the food over time and storing that value. So that what you end up with is that the entire run length is sort of the sum of two you know, remembered integrals, spatial integrals, the distance between the food um, and, and the distance from the food before it, 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 it turns around. And so we can crunch this into a model and, 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 and see if it can predict this sort of uh, distribution of where the fly is, is reversing after the experiments. And it's you know, kind of consistent with her. So this model can predict it, doesn't mean it's right. But um, this model has no spatial really memory. It's not like the animal knows a specific location. It just has to know these two. Um, spatial scales. And so what I think is going on here, which is kind of, this is more for sort of, if you think about ecology or optimal foraging, um, what this algorithm would do is that when a fly is searching in a dense patch of food, um, it, it will actually make sort of short um, run distances, run lengths that scale with food density. Whereas if it's, if it's foraging in a patch of food that, that, that's, uh, 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 you know, <coughs> a, a sparser, um, it's, its run length will, will increase because you know, the, the distance between food that it had previously sampled also increases. So this might be one sort of um, you know, evolutionary ecological um, a, a, a explanation for, for uh, uh, what's going on. OK, thank you for that indulging. I know it didn't have anything to do with, with fly, flight which was my promise. But the important thing that, that you know, I think is interesting is how this region of the brain that's very, very, very ancient um, you know, can be used for, for different tasks that involve spatial orientation uh, and memory. And, and to be fair, based on the uh, uh, sort of comparative neuro, neuroanatomical record and the work of Nick Straussfeld and others, it's likely that the central complex evolved in walking animals before insects evolved flight.
and then it got co-opted um, for, for, for flight behaviors that we see in Crown Taxa. So in the last um, 15 minutes, <clears throat> what I want to talk about is another specialization we find in flies that is unique to flies that has to do to the distribution, um, the, um, the, the organization of the, the muscles with which they fly. So flies um, flap their wings back, they power their wings using a set of muscles we call power muscles, for good reason. So when a fly hits your windshield, this is what you're looking at. A fly is about 50% of these muscles. They fill the thorax. They have amazing molecular uh, and functional specializations that I don't have the time to, to go into. Um, but um, they're, they're, the, each contraction is not uh, controlled by an electrical impulse from the nervous system. Rather, they stretch activate each other. So it's like a, a, magnet, a, a, a mechanical resonator that can pump energy, strain energy into the thorax, which like makes the wings go back and forth. Um, flight control, the ability to, to, to steer, is performed by a set of little tiny muscles that are good twitch muscles. Um, each action potential in the motor neuron uh, uh, you know, causes a, a, a change in biomechanical properties. And they insert on the um, inside of the wing hinge in a very, very complicated way. And through the action of these little muscles, which function as little controllable springs, the animal is able to distort its wing motion into different um, configurations, which then cause changes in, in aerodynamic forces and moments, and allow the animal to steer. So, so steering is really the, 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 you know, the function of, of this tiny set of, of muscles, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, there are four groups of these muscles. There are exactly 12 of them that are organized in four groups, depending upon what little tiny skeletal bits called sclerites that are right in the armpit of the fly. And, and I'm not going to worry about the, the names, especially you know, the details of, the, of this arcane infrastructure. But each, when muscles pull on one of these four little elements in the wing hinge, the wing gets distorted in a, in a particular way. Each muscle is regulated by one and only one motor neuron each. So there are 12 motor neurons, there are 12 muscles. Um, for the aficionados in the crowd, like each muscle is just a single motor unit. Um, and it, it's, these are tiny muscles. They're kind of tendons with an attitude. So through the years, we've developed some techniques for putting little tiny electrodes in these little muscles, but it's pretty damn hard. Um, and, and there's only a, a couple of muscles that are large enough for electrophysiological recordings. But in recent years, uh, what we've been able to do using genetic techniques, and this was pioneered by Thad Lindsay in the laboratory, is we can express the calcium indicator G-CAMP in the steering muscles and visualize their activity through the cuticle of the fly in, in flies flying in a, in a flight simulator playing a little video game. And what you see, sort of see here is a movie of the activity <laughs> measured with the dynamics of, of, of the calcium indicator. And I don't know if you can see it in this lighting, but what you should see is there's certain muscles that are, are sort of bright all the time, and there are other muscles that are kind of turning on going blinky blinky occasionally. And this is a pattern that is very consistent. So if you look across all the muscle groups, there are certain muscles whose activity is, is, is always on with sort of you know, modulations over time, and we call these the tonic muscles. And then also associated with, with each muscle group, there are muscles that are usually off and are only occasionally recruited. And if you do an expanded uh, uh, time scale, what you see is that these phasic muscles in particular are recruited only when the animal is exhibiting um, rapid steering maneuvers, uh, as indicated by the, the fast changes in wing motion that are plotted at, at, at the top. So there's this stratification of these muscles into phasic muscles that are, uh, that, that are only recruited occasionally and tonic muscles that are on all the time that we, we believe are, are sort of setting the, you know, the, the basic trim of the system. And um, just to sort of give a little more details into this, when an animal performs a really fast, rapid maneuver um, like, 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 like that, it turns out that that's generated by actually rather subtle changes in wing motion, but wing motion that is um, <clears throat> elicited very, very, very quickly. Um, and so th th this is, you know, one thing the animal needs to steer is to make, you know, subtle changes in wing motion that are very, very, very fast. Another thing an animal has to do, however, 
especially if it, um, say, encountered wing damage. So here's a fly flying along where uh, we deliberately cut one of the wings in half, a nasty people that we are. And if you then plot the changes in wing motion that allows this fly to fly stable compared to a normal pattern of wing motion, the, both the damaged wings and intact wings are flapping in a very, very, very different way, consistently in a different way, precisely the, you know, the different way that's necessary to make sure that the animal is not spinning out of control and is flying straight. So sort of in summary, what, what you have with these tonic muscles is a slow guidance system that can allow the animal to sort of maintain a constant heading, maintain a basic trim as it flies along, and then you have a rapid maneuvering system with these phasic muscles that can ex elicit uh, a, a, a quick changes in, 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 in flight trajectory, say, to get away from a, a looming pre predator. So that's just the basic background of these steering, um, these steering muscles. And in the last little bit, I, I, I want to um, dive down into um, uh, a, a, an important aspect of their physiology. Um, if you record from these muscles, particularly the tonic muscles, so this is a high-speed video combined with an electrophysiological recording from one of the muscles, the B1 muscle. You don't have to remember the name, except it's the muscle that got me tenure, so I'm very fond of it. Um, th this muscle fires a single um, spike, every single wing beat, at roughly the same phase. Um, Biomechanical work on this muscle years ago showed that if you vary that phase of activity, that subtly changes the mechanical properties of the muscle, particularly effectively the stiffness, the dynamic stiffness. So what we think is going on um, with, with these muscles, and you know, this is similar to work in, 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 in other systems and in, in work of Anna Ahn and others in cockroaches, um, that this muscle is being used by the animal like a little controllable spring. And the way the nervous system can regulate the, the, the stiffness of the spring is by either making the muscle fire a little bit early in each flapping cycle or a little bit later. So, so, so it's by regulating phase that's regulating the function of the muscle, which raises the question, what's determining the phase? What's the timer? What's the clock? It's not a central pattern generator, it turns out, um, for reasons uh, I won't d describe that, <coughs> for lack of time, I won't go into that evidence. But the, you know, the, 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 the information is actually coming from mechanoreceptors that are on the wings, that, that are firing at specific phases, that ti those timing signals are going into the nervous system, activating the motor neurons, which then make the, 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 the muscles active at the right time in the stroke. But if, if you build a system like this, where the, the sensors were on the wings themselves, that would run into certain problems, because the wings are, of course, aerodynamic structure. So as the animal uh, performs a maneuver, the, the, the loading on the wing changes, and that would change you know, the feedback coming from the wing. So it would sort of compromise the role of mechanoreceptors on the wing as a, as a little clock that the motor system can use. So how would you solve this problem? Well, one solution would be to say, hey, let's take one wing and say, you don't get to make aerodynamic forces. You're just a metronome. You're just a clock. You know, I'm just going to turn you into like a little nubbin, and your job is going to be to oscillate up and down and, 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 and provide little timing cues that the, the central nervous system can use. And so I'm going to argue that this is exactly what has happened in flies. So if, if you're a fly aficionado, you'll know that flies are unique among insects in that they've turned their hind wing into this drumstick structure called a halter. So the halter, I, I, I kept saying I was going to do this, and I didn't. I should come on this side of the room. Um, so the halter, you can see that little uh, drumstick-like thing behind the wing. It, it beats in antiphase um, with the wing, um, so in, in a fruit fly about 220 times a second. And if you look at the structure of the halter, it's, the base of the halter is covered with mechanosensory fields. It, it has around between 250 to 400 neurons arranged in about five different fields, depending upon species. And these are incredibly sensitive structures called campaniform sensilla that encode the motion of the halter as it beats back and forth. So most of these fields are firing just as the halter is going back and forth. Um, and of course, because it's uh, uh, synchronous with wing motion, they, pr they would provide these nice timing cues um, effectively in wing time. Now, if you, if you, you know, Google halt here, um, 
you, you'll actually get a lot of pictures of dumbbells. That's what they're named after, dumbbells. But if you go to the Wikipedia page on haltiers related to the flies, what you'll read is that the flies are supposedly, I mean, the haltiers are gyroscopes. They function as gyroscopes because, and this is true, at least one of this uh, set of sensilla on the base of the haltier are sensitive not to the up and back motion of the uh, back and forth motion of the haltier, but lateral deflection of the haltier caused by the corial forces that occur when the body of the animal rotates during flight. So the haltier is effectively a dual functioning system, basically functioning as a metronome to provide timing cues and a gyroscope to tell the fly. Um, that, it, that it's rotating, um, and, and there's a lot of interesting stories on the, on the gyroscopic function um, that, that I don't have time to go into. But the, 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 the main thing I want to say is, okay, regardless of the role of the haltier, um, if you have this beautiful monosynaptic system of, of, of mechanoreceptors on the haltier <coughs> controlling the steering muscles of the wing, how do you change the activity of the steering muscles of the wing? How can you get the fly to do anything active? Um, and uh, with this sort of hardwired system. And the, 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 the solution, or at least part of the solution that we think, is that not only does the wing have little tiny steering muscles, the haltier has little tiny steering muscles. So um, at the base of the haltier, there's a set of, of, of steering muscles that are the serial homologs of the steering muscles at the base of the Oops. wing. Um, and these are extremely uh, tiny structures. But it turns out we can record from them using the same optical uh, methods that, that were used for the uh, muscles at, at the base of the wing. And these were experiments done by Brad Dickerson, who now has his own group at University of North Carolina. So you can image the activity of the haltier muscles when you present the animal with visual motion. So the animal is being presented with, with, with visual motion, and we get changes in, in the animal steers. Um, in response to that visual motion, and the pattern of these haltier muscles uh, 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 ch changes over time. In another set of experiments that are similar, you can record using two photon uh, microscopy from the terminals of the haltier sensory neurons um, in the brain of the fly while the fly is flying under the two photon microscope, and again, present the animal with visual motion, and there's a change in the activity of, of the haltier afferents as, as recorded with the calcium indicator. So in summary, um, we, we have evidence from these experiments that, that, that descending input coming from the visual system changes the pattern of activity of the haltier muscles. And, and presumably, that's, that's what changes the feedback coming from the haltiers. So you change the way the haltiers are beating um, or, uh, or, the, or something subtly about the sensitivity of the haltier uh, sensory cells, that changes the activity from the sensory cells. Um, so that sort of raises the question, can, can these changes actually be responsible for changing the activity of wing muscles? And to do that experiment, what we need to do is sort of measure this, the, ch the changes in, in wing muscle phase that occur when this is all going on. So to test this, um, and these are experiments done by Alicia D'Souza in the laboratory. We give optogenetic activation of the motor neurons of the haltier muscles. Unfortunately, in, and, and while we record from the steering muscles of the wing, and this is possible in flies due to effort, collaborative effort with uh, Erica Earhart and others at Genalia and a, a, a Annie Huda in my laboratory, we've identified a series of driver lines in flies specific for steering muscles of the haltier. And we can then use these driver lines to express the uh, CS crimson ch uh, uh, channel, just as we use in those um, e experiments on feeding. But in this case, what we're doing is we're activating the motor neurons of these haltier muscles while we're recording um, the spikes in, in the uh, uh, steering muscles on the wing. And lo and behold, we found one driver line that labeled two motor neurons. Um, and when we activated these motor neurons, we got a phase advance in the firing of this uh, uh, steering motor neuron, which was consistent across flies. And we also got a recruitment of one of the phasic muscles that is usually silent. Uh, and these muscles are agonists of one another, so this makes sense. And coincidentally, 
to other motor neurons when we activate them cause a phase delay in the firing of this muscle. So there's like a push and the pull that's available in, in the nervous system that would presumably allow the animal to steer by you know, increasing the stiffness or decreasing the stiffness of these steering muscles, therefore making the wings beat a different way, changing the aerodynamic forces and moments, um, allowing the animal um, to, to, to change its flight course. So, so this is just um, kind of a hypothesis for what we think sort of happened in, in evolution that originally, you know, it flies evolved from four-winged insects, um, relying on mechanosensory feedback from the sensors of the wing. But what happened in flies is they, they build a more precise system by, by, by sacrificing one of those wings into a halter that has, has very, very precise timing signals that are not contaminated by the production of aerodynamic forces, um, and, and yet still the activity can be regulated by descending commands that, that act through the motor system of the halter. Maybe simultaneously, maybe subsequently, the system was co-opted as a gyroscope by allowing some of those sensory cells uh, at the base of the halter to be specialized to detect lateral deflections that occur when the, when the animal's body uh, uh, rotates during, during flight. So that's sort of the, the, the end of my little uh, example of these sort of two features of, of what, it, you know, what it means to be a fly, um, having a navigational sense involving this fascinating structure called the central complex, and then this very unique flight motor that involves this you know, wonderful structure of the halter. Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I want to thank everybody in, in, my, in my laboratory. But before I go, um, and this is a little bit of a downer, I apologize, um, but um, I'm amending this to like all of my talks now. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've studied flying insects for 30 years, starting at about the time that a group in Germany started monitoring the population uh, uh, density of, of, um, of insects in 97 sites around uh, uh, Germany, which they did dutifully um, for the next 27 years, measuring you know, how many insects, flying insects they were, they were capturing traps. So this is exactly my, my career. Well, my career has, well, some people would say my career has gone beyond 2015. It's a matter of debate. But nevertheless, you know, so th this represents um, a 75% drop in insect biomass. So where there used to be eight insects, there are now two. Um, over exactly the same time, period in North America, there's been a, a collapse of three, roughly three billion birds. Um, the three billion birds, the, the ones that are hardest hit are the insectivorous birds. So, um, you know, there's this emerging story that um, a lot of the world is running out of food. Um, and it's not visible as sort of habitat loss because you don't see the insects disappearing. Um, but, uh, you know, this is like very disturbing. I think we should all be disturbed by these trends. So what's causing it? It's very complicated. Probably the most likely uh, 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 culprit is the use of uh, neonicotinoid pesticides um, that are very important in, in, in agriculture. But I think it's sort of a case where we, you know, we normally think about, you know, we're, we're losing the polar bears, we're losing koalas. And, and I have nothing against koalas or polar bears, but these are usually described as like, you know, canaries in the coal mine. They give us a sense that things are going bad. This is not a case of canaries in the coal mine. This is a case of the whole damn coal mine collapsing if we lose, you know, these, these uh, I insect population densities. So this is sort of all the more reason why, um, you know, you should think before you swat next time and, and I hope have some, you know, appreciation because I, I, I think, you know, as a research scientist, um, I, I think we also have, uh, you know, responsibility to kind of think more broadly about, um, you know, the world and how we should be expending energy in the world. And, and it's actually, uh, this isn't just flippant. I mean, the reason that I've started moving into the field and studying how animals move over large distances in the field is really to sort of perhaps tweak my research towards something that can be a little more helpful in understanding the implications of these global changes that we're seeing. So anyway, um, s sorry for that bit, but um, um, I'm, I promised my daughter I'd do this from now on. I really appreciate the uh, invitation to come here. Uh, uh, I, you know, Georgia Tech, uh, uh, Emory, the whole area is just a, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a really important um, you know, node of, of, of scientific research, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to visit for the first time. So thanks a lot. <clears throat>
so that people can leave. The folks that need to leave can go ahead, but if there's any like last questions that people want to ask, uh, the folks that can stay, do that for a few minutes and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. So the distance that they insert, you're saying, is a function of the density of their food. Um, s sort of. I mean, I, I, uh, to be more specific, like if, if the animal is sort of sampling food, and I should say, this is like the work that really nice work by Carlos Ribera in Portugal. You know, if you give a fly a buffet, it doesn't just go up to like the, you know, the lobster bisque and stuff itself. It, 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 it samples you know, from one food spot to the other. It goes around all the time. And there's good reason for that because it's probably trying to maintain the carbohydrate to, to, to protein ratio. So the idea of the animal sort of sampling, and then for some reason it's sort of like, it, it, it leaves the patch. Then the idea is that like the, the, like the, the you know, the, 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 it remembers that distance. So the runs that it would do um, would be scaled to, you know, the density of food that has been previously p sampling. So I do the same thing with colobars. And funny thing is, they will do a search radius equivalent to the colobar of egg, which is a component of their fluid environment. They will go outside the egg. Why right. Not? They got lost here. Right. No, no, it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, oh, physics behind. No, I don't. You know, um, I've thought about this a lot, mostly in the context of the chemical cues that they could be using to find the food. But you know, flies live in like super advex. Like the Paclay numbers are astronomical. So you know, diffusion plays absolutely no, you know, no, no role in this. Yeah. Um, I, I could have more conversation about that. But thanks for your question. Yeah. In some of the amino taxis, uh, yeah. I noticed that you also had points at 180 degrees, which means that they're tracking the sun behind. Yeah. Did, did I get that right? Is it can be. So flies have, they do have a little bit of a blind spot, but it's about like 40 degrees. Oh. So, um, you know, they have basically panoramic vision, um, which is typical of most flying insects. So, um, you know, being able to have, I mean, it's true that there's definitely a little bit of a bias towards forward amenotactic angles, but you know we find them behind, and we're not sure if that, f you know, that forward angle is cases where the fly is kind of doing amenotaxis, or maybe these are cases where the f kind of phototactic behavior is taking over. But yeah, so no, it's physically fly possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely physically possible. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why flies are hard to swat. You know, for me. Yeah. Um, I was also interested in the amenotaxis especially since there's migrating animals that might need to change their heading during yeah. the day. Yeah. So do they have like a circadian rhythm that they could incorporate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, excellent question. So in monarch butterflies um, and in bees, um, they do what the uh, physiologists call time compensation. So they exactly compensate for the, you know, the, the azimuthal motion of the sun during the day so that like the bee will will change its amenotactic angle such that it's always going towards the hive or, or back towards, or towards the flowers, even though now the sun is in a different position. So these are classic experiments, and, and, and um, but migratory butterflies do the same thing. So we've tested this in, in fruit flies, and we haven't found any evidence for, for, for time compensation. And in other animals, that, like dung beetles that use the sun you know, again, to just to sort of be able to hold a course, uh, there isn't any evidence for time compensation. But it kind of makes sense. So it, it, an animal has about two, a fully fed fruit fly has about two hours of flight time in terms of gas, effectively. And, and over two hours, the, like the, 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 the difference in the trajectory that would be caused by the azimuthal motion of the sun is like trivial. Like it, it, it's, it, so I don't think there would have been like really l strong selection for time compensation when you're using the sun compass just for, you know, these like two hour dispersal distances. So that is kind of the, the rationalization, but it's a great question. And in other insect species, there's very, very strong evidence that they do do time compensation. In yeah. What's that? In cataglyphus. Um, in cataglyphus, um, yeah, and cataglyphus, well, the, the thing about cataglyphus is a little different is that like every time the animal forages, yeah. it's like resetting its compass. So it doesn't really have to do time compensation because it's only foraging for a given amount of time. If they don't find any food, they get the hell back to the nest because they would dry up and be little crispy guys. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, on that note, I think we uh, yeah. need to move on so Mike can have lunch with the students. So thank you. <laughs>